Srinivas Perry and my main function at Adobe is to foster DevOps best practices and culture across various groups and organizations. And today along with Alex, I'm going to walk you through the journey. I'm Alex Honor. I'm founder of a new company, Simplify Ops, but also founder of DTO Solutions. Um, also project lead of Rundeg, not to uh, unsolicited advertisement here. And I've been focusing on automating deployment and doing DevOps consultancy for the last five years. So I've been in, in the trenches trying to uh, help solve this problem uh, for customers like uh, Adobe. And my main focus now is making operations simple, easy, and fun. And personally, I'm also here because I, I learned a lesson. I'm an engineer by, by background. And that is, just because you can make something doesn't mean that you can sell something. And if you can't sell something, there really isn't any point in making it unless it's for a hobby or for fun. And uh, you're going to hear about what we helped transform uh, Adobe to uh, a new capability. And it, the, the tough part wasn't the engineering part. The, the tough part was letting people know what this initiative was all about and explaining it in a way that they could be interested and, and see if they wanted to be a participant in it. All right. So the last few years, Adobe has been transforming from traditional desktop with software where we sell boxes to the subscription-based software and the cloud services. So what this means is Adobe will be able to deliver the features much faster to the customer, unlike before, where they have to wait for several months to get a new feature. Right? So what does this mean to the engineering teams? My group, Codetech Tools and Infrastructure, is responsible for developing productivity tools, essentially to turn something like this, look at the places where this not adding a lot of value, and make the things and convert them into the value. Essentially, give the value back to the business. That's what's our role. For the traditional desktop, we developed lots of tools, frameworks, uh, uh, build forms, and so many things, and we added a lot of value to the business, right? So when Adobe started transitioning to the cloud, what does that mean to our group, right? So that's where my group's journey started. So we were, business gave us basically two big guidelines, right? One is make sure we will be able to hit the market window that we want to, and second thing is retain the quality of the products, right? That's what customers of Adobe love. <coughs> so now I will kind of go through the journey that we had for the last three years and why I'm standing here actually speaking, right? Uh, the first thing that we did is, uh, uh, along with my uh, manager, we actually we had a license to uh, do that. We went to all the different SaaS groups across the business units, and in 2010, whoever like SaaS kind of groups, we asked, we, we interviewed them. What are you guys doing? What are you using for tools and those kind of things? To be honest, at that point, my, my mind is about, because I came from the automation as a tools thing, so which tools are you using? Tell me that, right? That's when I met this gentleman, Dan Neff. He's not here today, but Dan Neff came to Adobe from Facebook, and he is an operations guru for Photoshop.com. The first thing he told me is, stop. Let's not discuss about tools. He had a great system that is working for them, but he did not tell me that. He Googled in front of me this video. Does anybody recognize this? Right. So this is the 10 plus deployments per day by John Alspa and Paul Hammond. He asked me to take a look at this thing and uh, learn the DevOps best practices and tools. Remember, he did not sell me the tool, right? That's the great lesson that I learned. And from then on, I went to my first Velocity conference in 2010, followed by the DevOps days right after that, learned tons of things thanks to both of these events in the past few years. And that's when I met these two gentlemen, Alex Honor, and Damon, maybe somewhere here. There's a, there's a All right. Yeah. So, yeah, they they have been in this business of tools automation from ages, 
Yeah. And then the thing that really struck me is they introduced me to the concept of loosely coupled tool chain. Oh my God, that's exactly what I learned and what I heard from them, right? So then from then on, we formed the team. Along with my, I have a geographically distributed team, uh, great DevOps people, along with them, and we put, we got uh, GTO on board. Along with them, we did a tons of work, learned, did some things, did not work. We improved our sorry, architecture quite a bit, and what we delivered as a part of our three-year journey is a service delivery platform called CDOM. C dot stands for connecting the dots. We'll talk more in the future slides. C dot today is being used by several groups at Adobe for doing the self-service deployments. And something interesting happened. Adobe acquired Typekit, and Paul Hammond is part of Adobe right now. And Typekit group is using C dot. And Paul liked it, and that's when he endorsed our group to the John Alspa and he endorsed me for this talk. That's the journey that we had. That is the reason why I'm here talking in front of you about the Devo Adobe DevOps journey. I think it's a great thing about this Velocity community because I remember Lee Thompson and I did a talk a couple years back on the loosely coupled tool chain concept. And it's just, you know, part of the DevOps movement is sharing these ideas. And it's kind of interesting how it just sort of went around in a circle back to the same people that inspired Perry in the first place. So I think that that's why uh, Velocity is such a great conference. So three years from then, Adobe, as of this Monday, the all Adobe software is being served only through the cloud, right? That's a big shift that Adobe has gone through. And my group has transitioned to the Cotec Solutions Engineering Group with the main goal of enabling the services and enabling the innovation and that part. So it's the reason we are able to get to this stage is because a lot of things happen. The guys like Dan F guided in the right direction. So we need people like him to preach DevOps in organizations, right? And the conferences like Velocity and DevOps, we learn tons of things. I'm sure you guys have learned tons of things this week. Make sure next week you do something, because if you don't do next week, probably you will not do it till next Velocity, right? And the third thing is, don't reinvent the wheel. Get the help of guys like this and get the experts and then uh, speed up the process, right? And that's what helps. And then I would like to thank publicly my awesome team, who all great DevOps guys who actually made this happen. I'm here because of them. So one thing I thought was interesting there that, let me just go back to this last slide, is, you know, let's call it the, the old business model here, it was about enabling tools. So it's a tools group. But because of the challenge that uh, the Adobe company had in moving all their desktop tools to the cloud, you know, it's not just a matter of tools, it's, it's giving them a solution. And, and I think, you know, that quote below, we make enabling services, that was the key change. And, you know, that was a personal realization for us too, that as experts or as people who, you know, do this as a living, that we realize we're not toolsmiths anymore. We're actually creating services and helping people become service providers. And uh, I thought that was, you know, sort of an eye-opening difference in, in how you think about what the solution's gonna be, how you deliver it to the people in the company that need it. And you can imagine there's a new kind of responsibility. If you're a service provider in your company, what does that mean? What are the things you need to think about? How does that change your thinking about design? But when you step back and you ask, well, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? We like to call these like islands of tools. These are really silos. People work in these silos. You know, you'll have build engineers, for example, who know about their build tools. They care about the build process. They're thinking about the build scripts, thinking about you know, dependencies in the build and the artifacts that they create and where they need to be stored. And uh, so they might be using some package tools. Those package tools might be chosen by the dev team. Maybe there's some decisions with the ops guys on what tools those should be. But in any case, they pick some package formats and then they get migrated out to different package repositories. There might be many package repositories. There could be some in dev, maybe it's Nexus or, or Artifactory, maybe it's Yum. Um, they need to move from environment to environment, but there, maybe it's the release management group that's responsible for that part of the, of the process. On the system side, you know, there's managing the operating systems, patching, uh, limiting the configuration drift, uh, just making the state of the systems known. That's a whole other domain. 
And how do you coordinate deployment, or how do you coordinate, uh, you know, operations in a large-scale network? Um, you know, that's in the domain of the orchestration tools. Maybe that's uh, uh, in the system and engineering group. Of course, you've got source repositories, hopefully, for everything. Yeah. And it might be a common source repository, or there might be a source repository for each one of these groups. Now, if you step back and you think about what does a software development lifecycle really mean, it really means all the handoffs between these islands. It really means moving these bits of information or these packages or these files across from all these different domains across these different islands. So that, that really is the DevOps problem or the release management or the app lifecycle problem that you're trying to connect together. So if you think about this sort of just in isolation, it looks like maybe a complex process. But in truth, especially for a company like Adobe, you have many business units, many, each unit creating its own product, and they have to manage this across the board. So if you're a company that's trying to go from desktop to the cloud, imagine that your technology management or business management, what, what it really means is that all of these dots have to be connected across the board to meet that market window. And in the case of Adobe, that was June 2013. So I think it's a great name, the C dot, connect the dots, because really that's what it's about. It's about creating a streamlined process, given enabling tooling at the right stage, but in a way that it's the people that are responsible for that stage can plug their stuff, inject their stuff in there. And uh, I like the metaphor Perry has here. It's like a transportation system. So we have this uh, picture here with the, the road across the islands in Florida, but you know, it's about moving those bits smoothly and quickly across all those different aspects of the process. So Perry, I, let's, let's see, see you drill down a little bit more on C dot. Sure. I'll be going a little bit detail into an R30,000 view and architecture a little bit. And then at the end of that, there's a video coming. I just want the preparation up. So if you miss some of this, you can catch that again. So at the 30,000 feet level, Adobe has lots of teams. Like Adobe's creative cloud consists of several teams working together, right? Some of these services are Java, some of them are Python, some of them PHP, some Node.js, Ruby, you name it, right? And each team is productive in their stuff, they have their own stuff, right? And uh, this architectures and code as a package gets deployed to different places. Most of the stuff that we use recently is AWS, but we have some services in Rackspace. Several of them in data centers, Singapore, D D Dallas, Dublin, uh, Oakland. So law, we have a lot of data centers. We, whenever by a company, we get another data center, right? And then we have some of them in internal IT for a reason, right? So how do you get a system, deployment system, where a code goes reliably from different services to different providers? What the C dot provides is it's a service delivery platform, meaning a transportation system. Is, which is service architecture agnostic, and it is a cloud provider agnostic. And it is done with the, on top of an open source tool chain. So this is the tool chip, less tool chain that we use as of today, June 2013, right? But whatever the tool that best of it, we want to take an advantage of it. So today, many of the systems, if you pick some tool chain and you just do it, you got stuck into it because you invested on it, right? And you see something great coming up, like, and, uh, AWS Ops works or something else. So, but you don't have a time to invest on it and redo the tooling. That's exactly what we would like to avoid, right? And that's exactly what the C dot provides to the service engineering teams. So, and within the C dot, the way to look at the C dot for us is just like we have an API from infrastructure for AWS, you similarly C dot provides an API for deployment and operations. All the day-to-day -day operations you're thinking about, creating an environment, deploying an environment, del create, deleting an environment, updating an environment, and then even informational APIs like which services, which package, and who is deploying when, right? All these things, you don't ask to, right? You want to have an API. That's exactly what C dot provides, right, API. And what the way it happens is it has an integration layer which talks to several tools with an API, and in theory, if we have to replace Chef with Puppet or something like that and all that, we sh only the integration layer needs to be changed. And we have a very nice UI workbench 
that we give it to the engineering teams and operations teams. The point here is both engineering team and operations team are using the same tool, right? Same workbench, which is on top of the UI, this uh, API. And through that, uh, dev does all the deployments and with one click, promotion happens to the ops, ops logs in, and using that, they deploy to stage and production. So all the environments are properly locked with the ACL and all that. This is all good, but we are missing one important piece, right? If you double click on any of this service architecture, we have a code, right? When you talk about a code, the one, Adobe has been in the business of delivering desktop products for ages. We clearly understand the CI part, right? This is application code. You don't want to hard code the data in the application. So there is an application configuration. You got to test it. So there is a verification code. There's a dev function, QE function, together or separate or whatever. So they understand it, right? They, and, and as a part of last decade, we knew that, I mean, QE is not somewhere there. QE unit test happens. You do it early. The bug found after shipping to the customer versus the bug found when that line of code is written, there's a difference there, right? So this language, it's very, um, Adobe gets it, we all get it, right? So what's new when you are transitioning to the cloud is this called operations code. Again, not to mistake this with an ops code. Ops code is a chef, that's one of the thing, but that's not the only thing. When you're talking about operations code, all the stuff that you do, what, what is my service topology like? For AWS, you have a cloud formation. There's a template, there's a code for it, right? And then which package should go to where? All the promotion logic, you have those scripts. And you may have an orchestration scripts like do a deployment for 10% and then 30% or 40%. You're writing all these kinds of code. They're all scripts. They are code, right? Who is responsible for that code? Is it dev or is it ops, right? I mean, the point here is, big realization that we say is operations code is part of your product, right? So application code, verification code, operations code is your stuff. And what CDOT provides you is a vehicle, if you will, so that this can safely go to wherever they need to go to. I will double click a little bit on these tools, Jenkins, Rundeck, and Chef, and how we are using it. Like I said, CI, right? We all get it. You have a part force, GitHub, or whatever, and then we build it, and then packages are in the repository. Now, how these packages go to the cloud or data center? So here we have a decision to make, right? So shall we bake all these packages into AMI and then bless them, put the blessed AMIs in the cloud? in AWS, right? And from then on, there's no deploy. You just launch the AMI, you're done, right? Like the bake approach works, right? And if you have to do a small change here and there, you have to repeat all this big process and all that painful, right? So sometimes, no, bake is not. We want to go for a fry approach, meaning you uh, put only the bare, uh, bare minimum things there, rest you write a chef cookbook or whatever the manifest and all that, and you promote your pocket packages and stage it in a artifact repository in the cloud, like S3 or data center. Right? So now you are ready to do CD. We are done with the CI and we prepared for CD. Now in order to do the CD, the way CD happens is in our case, we have a Jenkins Rundeck plugin. As soon as the build is done, it triggers the Rundeck. So Rundeck tool is a very lightweight tool. Think of it as all the commands that you're typing with so many tabs that you're typing is there is just give a web interface to that, right? That's all. It's the reason we really like the Rundeck as a lightweight tool is because it has a very good, nice API, and it's a very lightweight tool, needs almost zero minutes to learn the tool, right? So with Rundeck, the moment the CD is done, we get the packages, and Rundeck, the job, will update the chef server with the, what the packages that you are going to deploy, and then on, it calls the cloud API. In this case, AWS, it launches the cloud formation. And once the cloud formation is done, that AMI already has a built-in bootstrap thing, which has a logic for, depending upon which project, which environment, and which node role, it'll go and pick the right 
code from the Chef server. It will go and pull the ripe packages that we staged in the S3 and do the local orchestration with the Chef cookbooks. Boom. After that, your business service is up and running. Right? So a couple of things to highlight here is uh, the decision of is it a bake or a fry? Is it a push or a pull? These are the decisions. It's not either or or. Depending upon what state of project you are in, depending upon which environment, you may have to make these decisions. Right? So what this architecture allows you to do is that going back to that slide, it will help depending upon what for the different service architectures, you can tune things based on your operations code. That's all good from the technology point of view, right? What does this mean for the business? What is business getting in? So we learned there are three important things for the business, right? So first and foremost thing is, you have all these developers, right? They have tons of ideas. They are developing features. Today, they get stumbled upon each other because they are using either Chef or same organization, or they, are, they don't have a, a ability to create an environment for them, is this thing. So there's a waiting happening, right? So what we learned is first and foremost thing that we would like to have here is with one click from a Git feature branch to a complete business environment into AWS, right? That's the first number one thing. Once you have any one of them, and then, of course, this will involve some cost. So we have some features like a lease feature by default environment comes in, and after a couple of hours, it goes away, right? So that way, you give the flexibility at the same time, you save the cost. And second most important thing is you have a gate. This is where the quality comes in, right? So before you go to the master branch, any all the pull requests will get reviewed in your daily stand. I mean, they get reviewed. One of the part of your daily stand-up is what are the pull requests out there, right? Blah, blah, blah. You see it, and then go. The moment, every day you can make the decision. You can make the decision as often as you want to, right? The moment you approve your changes to the master branch, you are now ready to deploy. So people talk a lot about continuous deployment to production, but the companies like us or many companies are not there, or most of the time they don't need it. We don't have to continuously deploy to the production. But what we realized is we need to do a continuous deployment to at least one environment, right? And just to make clear, we named that the environment as a CD, right? Or from the master branch, it gets continuously deployed to CD environment. And why is that important? In the process, you are actually testing your actual deployment code, which can be uh, so that your product, a deployment to the production is totally a non-event, right? And then last but not the least step is handoff. Once you, you each check into the master is getting built and you have all of it, and you can make a choice of how often you want to update the production. If your test suite is really good, you can put in a logic and say that any CDs after it passes these three things directly deploy to the production. That that can become a continuous deployment to the production. Like I said, that's not a need for many of the cases. In our most of our cases the production deployment is handled by our SRE group, the Cloud Ops group, and uh, they manage stage and production. What they need is a reliable way of handling of the packages. Before CDOT, they get the list of steps in the wiki page, and some guy carefully typing all of it, and he's doing right most of the time, right? So when he's on vacation or is not there, that's a problem. But with CDOT, anyone can log on to the CDOT, and if we have a access permission, he can go and click on to the production at any point. He can promote it. So, and then we also learned that DevOps engineering and SRE, as a DevOps engineering, all the stuff happens. As you can see, that bar is big, right? That's where you are. There's a pain, no matter whether you like it or not. So you are moving the pain forward. Bring the, if it is painful, do it more often. Bring it forward. If you have good system like this, and SRDs can focus more on what they are good at and what they want to, rather than getting frustrated with getting the bad package. So these are the couple of screenshots, and I have run a video which uh, show you. This is the uh, landing page of CDOT. You will see the projects, and you will see how many pro uh, deployments happen, how many fail, and all that. And uh, uh, this is all like based on your preferences, and you will see only the projects that you are uh, entitled to. 
and this is the initial workbench for each service. As you can see here, uh, this just this portion itself, it's, it answers five questions. How many environments do I have? What is their flow? How is the code flowing? And what packages do they have? When were they last deployed? What is the current state? Just to get these information without CDART, you have to call a few people, you have to check some emails, you have to look at some wiki. That's the pain point. That's what we are trying to solve with this, with the API-based approach, with a loosely coupled tool chain. And while uh, it's not only just a view thing, but actions happen right from here, you can go and click on it, and while the stuff is happening, you can see now running activity, and think of it as like an IRC, you, who is deploying what and which environment, you'll get it. So, this is all we did it as a, it's not a function, right? It's a service. C dot is we service delivery platform delivered as a service. So all the stuff that you have as a commands or one click, there's an API on top of it. I think that's a big lesson that we learned as a part of it. And that helps a lot for the deployment pipeline. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I keep talking this a lot at Adobe with several groups, right? But during that, we learned that I, I, I may not be as efficient one day or other. The point, uh, passing the message is more important. So I have a great team there, and then a couple of guys helped me in putting together a video that we put it on a website and people can see. I'm going to run that video. It's four and a half minutes. Sit back and enjoy that. This is the introduction to CDOT. The name CDOT stands for Connecting the Dots. CDOT is a service delivery platform developed by the Corporate oh. Systems Engineering Team. Go a little fast. Project yeah. environment activity and take action based on that information. Mickey Mouse version. So is there anything I should do to get this? <laughs> <laughs> Rapid delivery. Volume on the left. Yeah, okay. The environments and often several cloud. Okay, we'll start again. This is the introduction to CDOT. The name CDOT stands for Connecting the Dots. CDOT is a service delivery platform developed by the Cortec Systems Engineering Team. The goal of CDOT is to solve the current pain points that many Adobe service teams currently experience. The need to support many environments and often several cloud and data center locations, the multiple dependencies and tools, make the deployment process highly complex and often involve many manual steps causing it to be sensitive and error prone. CDOT is a service delivery platform that uses a set of open source, community supported tools such as Chef, Jenkins, and Rundeck to create a well integrated deployment tool chain. In addition, CDOT provides an API layer which can provide the service team with information about the current status in the service delivery tool chain. A service team may use the UI provided by the CDOT team or may choose to develop their own UI on top of the CDOT API layer. Together, the tool chain and API layers provide the service team a complete solution that offers one-click deployment solution. This enables automatic triggering of deployments to facilitate continuous deployment and enables team members to perform self-service deployments. It provides the ability to deploy in any environment with no manual steps. Deploy consistently with great confidence to production environments. Our solution uses model-driven deployment, which provides greater predictability and efficiency Centralized views based on RESTful APIs. One place to view all information about the project environment and activity and take action based on that information. 
frequent updates to the solution with updated tool chain efforts. This helps you stay ahead with industry tools while providing seamless integration. Fast onboarding time. Reach a state of advanced deployment automation in just a few weeks with minimum dependency on the CDOC team. Excellent support. The CDOT team provides 24-7 support. Our team members are located in the United States, India, and China. Our clients report the following comparisons before and after using CDOT. Deployments have become much faster and frequent. A typical deployment time went down to less than 10 minutes from two days on some projects. The total number of deployments increased from 25 to 930 in just one quarter. The success rate of those deployments achieved 95%. That's up 25% before the use of CDOT. Before CDOT, service teams had to ask their DevOps teams to perform deployments for them using email or other forms of communication. This communication overhead took time and was error prone. With CDOT, deployment is self-service, so service teams were able to trigger the deployments by themselves, making the process faster and dependable. With the use of CDOT, the quality of deployments is higher because of fewer manual steps and it's less error prone, thus making CDOT a more reliable deployment process. Hi. So I'm just kind of curious in the audience, is it surprising to see a video like this? Because it wasn't not made for this conference. This video was made for internal consumption. This was the first time I've ever seen something like this. And uh, I think really the lesson to learn here is that, as I was saying earlier, a lot of us know how to make things. A lot of us are problem solvers. That is actually the easiest part of actually helping the business. The hardest part is getting people to get on board with this idea and maybe adopting it or helping you design it or telling you what those problems are and getting your thinking aligned with what will make everybody successful. And I think it's just a reminder that it's marketing, you know, it comes down to a sales process. And because uh, I'm using the word sales, it's not really different because it's internal sales. If you've ever been involved with enterprise sales, it's pretty much the same exact uh, uh, way of going about it. First of all, people are busy, they've got a lot of problems, they're behind schedule, they're worrying about you know, their priorities and who's gonna be doing what and when. So if you go to them and say, hey, I've got this great CDOT, it does all these cool things, it has all these tools in here, it's what people are talking about, that's not gonna be interesting to them. It's really understanding what they're doing, like what, what's gonna help them. And there has to be something in it for them. It has to save them time. It has to let them do something that they didn't think they could do before if they had this kind of CDOT thing. And you know, everybody's day-to-day -day life, there are certain things that are hard to do, there are headaches, there are recurring problems. If you can address those kinds of issues in the conversation that you start with them, you're gonna have a more open mind. And in a big company, especially like a global enterprise, I hate to use the word politics, but they exist. You know, there are different ways of thinking, there's control issues, who's responsible, and you need to understand what those motivations are because you're gonna be stepping on toes. Something like CDOT or anything DevOps, by its nature, it cuts across the organization. It's, it's aspects that cut across everybody's daily work. So you, you have to understand what their mo motivations are, what drives them, what's their thinking. And something like CDOT or any one of these tools that you might introduce that you saw in that CDOT architecture means that they're gonna change the way they work than they do today. And nobody likes changing the way they work. It might not be the way they like to work, but it's the way they're used to working. And if, and if you don't listen to what those concerns are, the conversation won't proceed. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that you would do if you were cold calling somebody and you had some, you know, you're the fully brush man, you had something to sell. It's not really any different. Even if it's the greatest thing you ever designed, you know, it is a sales process. So, as a techie, sometimes that's kind of hard to accept, but it's the real world. Now, if you think about it as a salesperson, what does that mean? It means you got to 
bring backup material. You need to bring success stories or the best convincing artifacts. Somebody who's tried it, uh, lived with it, and saw a benefit from it. That's the most powerful message that you can bring to anybody. The other thing are, you know, if you have a big uh, initiative or a big kind of architecture like CDOT, and you just kind of launch it on people, it's a lot at once. And it's better to make it open because something like CDOT is something people have to plug into. So make it an open thing, have brown bag lunches, talk about the problem in general, let people know that you are interested in owning this problem and that you are committed to it. This is what you care about, it's what you live and breathe. People will then trust you a little bit more like, okay, that guy really cares, he's serious. So the, the mind will be open again. And of course, we just saw this example of a video um, because, you know, as Perry was saying, a company like Adobe, that's, that's an international company. There's no way you can get in front of everybody and have a convincing conversation with them. You just need to explain what you're doing in a way that you don't have to do it personally. So maybe this is kind of the second or third stage of the DevOps journey, but um, I've worked with a lot of big companies and I think that this is, you know, maybe something that takes some extra resources to prepare it, but you know, it's maybe what's necessary to get people to understand why you're doing this, what you're doing, and why it matters. And from a business standpoint, why it's gonna make things better on the whole. Now, I also think a CDOT, because maybe you're feeling like, well, there was a lot of parts in there. This is kind of a, this is an actual system. This isn't just some trivial tools that we're installing on one server. It's almost like a, a venture inside the company. And so I start thinking about it like a startup. You know, if it's a startup, you might be the, pro, the, the domain expert in this space. You might really know how to solve this problem. And you might think you know how to design the right solution, but that's just in your mind. The only way to test that you're doing it right or you're thinking right is to get outside of your office and go and talk to the people that will eventually use it or help you roll it out or help influence you, you know, in a successful way. So it's not in your team, it's out there. The people that you're worried about not accepting it, those are the people you need to talk to. So if we think about it like a salesperson, there's kind of, I'm just gonna skip to these three steps here. Um, there's really kind of three stages to it. First, you need to talk to the customers, the end users. In the DevOps world, we mean that to be like the product development group, you know, the engineering groups that are you know, initiating all this change and being driven by the business initiatives. So we mean that those are, those are like the users. Then there are the buyers, you know, the, the people that own the budget, because somebody might decide to self-fund a project like CDOT and use their own resources to roll it out, but later on you're gonna need more help. You're gonna need to get people involved, you might need to extend it. You're gonna need to ask for resources from somebody, and that somebody is like a finance guy. And then lastly, there are partners and suppliers, and those are the people that are gonna help you do this. They might help you host it, they might provide capacity to you. These are the people that you rely on to actually deliver the service. So if you put it in DevOps terms, it really means these kind of people, the dev people, business guys in finance, and maybe the ops guys could be security guys. But you know, these, these are the people that you eventually need to talk to. If you don't talk to them, if you don't have like basically business benefit that you can explain to them, any one of them can say no. And no matter how strategic you think the CDOT type of project will be, it might not ever get off the ground, or you may only have one success instead of 26 successes like CDOT has seen. So it's kind of easy to say this sort of in theory, you know, think like a sales guy, you know, get outside of your office, you know, have those conversations. But Perry and I have actually done this. <laughs> and we're gonna show you sort of a dramatized, way, you know, examples of these. But uh, they're typical, and I'm, I'm, if you have any examples of your own, don't be shy, jump up here and give us some of your own examples. So, every salesperson knows one golden rule, and that is you are gonna hear the word no. Somebody comes at you and you think they're selling something to you, you have a natural defensive reaction, and that is like, I don't want it. So, I'm going to be that guy and I have a special name tag for this guy. He is Mr. No. I can put this off my shirt here. Mr. No, if everybody can see that. Everybody's face, Mr. No. That's what he looks like. He wears a name tag like this. So, 
I'm going to be the engineering team because the sales guy knows you should start with the customer and make sure that you're addressing their needs first. And I'm going to pretend that I've just seen this presentation of CDOT and Perry's walked in and he's, he's here to tell me a little bit more. Of course, I have some questions. I'm, I'm busy, I'm behind on my backlog and I'm being told I have to finish all my stuff by June 2013 to make this cloud launch. So, my very first question is, Perry, you're helping people get to the cloud. I already deployed to the cloud. This is, I have my own AWS account. I wrote some scripts and I have, I've got this problem solved. I mean, why do I need to have something like CDOT? Okay, so Alex, you're already deploying to the cloud? Yeah, I've got a guy who wrote some scripts, deploys to the cloud. Okay, is it one guy doing it or you have a, uh, is that one guy doing it, or you have people doing it? Well, I don't do it. This guy, he he knows the uh, you know he knows the the Amazon command line tools. He wrote some scripts. He's he's pushing stuff where it needs to go. Uh, do you ever send him to vacation? Yeah, he goes on vacation. Okay, so what happens that time? Well, uh, that's a bit. Uh, well, I mean, somebody can figure it out from the scripts. It, it sometimes takes a little bit of time to uh, to get it out. I see. Okay, so I I do see some anti pattern there, but let's keep going. So let me ask another question. When was your last deployment to the production? Uh, it was about two weeks ago. Okay. Do you know which uh, what version of package and uh, dependencies packages and all that? Well, uh, we talked about it in our Scrum meeting. I think somebody's got some POM file or something that some. I, I, I think I could look it up. I could look it up if I needed to. Okay. Is it look it up when somebody compiled that information in Wiki or something? Yeah, we, we, we have a wiki. Everybody knows our wiki page. We, we have our information and we try to keep it up to date. So my friend, I mean, forget about C dot. I want to tell you that I already seen. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> cool. I think that was the hook. Okay. Well, if anybody has real objections, come see us afterwards. We have uh, other examples here in case not. Yep.